back off the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at um, how God prepares us, um, even as he gives us his dream and his vision. And we looked at the preparation process in the lives of? Who are the people? Moses. Me? <laughs> Moses, Paul, Joseph, David, and Jeremiah. Okay? So we see that during the preparation period, it's actually a waiting time for the execution of the fulfillment or the dream, the vision that God has for um, us. Okay, But during this waiting time, waiting time is not idle time. Okay, You know, when you wait, you're just sitting and waiting for the train or for, uh, for your interview or you're waiting for your, uh, for your turn to come. Uh, you're just idle, but it does not mean that you're not doing anything when you're waiting and you're in a preparation process. During the preparation process, you should be actively involved. What should be act you should what should you be actively involved doing? Getting yourself prepared for what God wants you to be prepared in. Okay. So getting actively involved in the preparation process and what God was assigning you to do so you know that this is God's plan and purpose. So you go and roll for courses, you get yourself prepared, your personal uh, uh, life, you get in order, your family life, management, uh, time management plan you have. You look at various aspects and you get yourself uh, ready. Look at um, one example we can look at is during um, Joseph's waiting time. You know, um, we see that he served with excellence, right? Whether he was in Potiphar's house or whether he was in the prison, he was serving. He, he did his work very dil diligently, sincerely. And that is why God caused Pharaoh and that is why God caused the jailer to look at Joseph, not because God had chosen him, God had a plan and purpose, and so he was, you know, divinely orchestrating things. What if um, Joseph had thrown a tantrum, saying, Hey, I'm not slave material, I'm not uh, a slave son, I've never swept, I've never swabbed, I've never cleaned in my life, I'm not going to do this, I'm just going to sit here. And when Pharaoh came into the house, he would just pretend as if to say he's cleaning. God looked at Joseph's attitude. Of course, the Bible does not say it, but we know it because when we look at the internal factors, God looks at our attitudes and our motives, why we are doing what we are doing. And that is why God also brought him to that place of fulfillment of his dream. I sort of delayed things. And also we know that David was tempted, but he did not give in to temptation. That's another aspect that we need to keep in um, mind. So we see even Moses when he was, um, um, you know, in the wilderness, what was he doing? He was not just sitting down idle. He got married. He had children. He also was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. Okay. So David during his um, time uh, when he was running away from King Saul, he was engaging in warfare. He led his 400 men. He was training his men up. He was engaging in warfare. He was, you know, positioning himself as a leader, as a confident leader, so that his men could believe and trust in, in him. And also remember when we learned in, um, uh, uh, in, that, uh, in the publication, uh, I think it was Code of Honor, I think, or Receiving God's Guidance, the second lesson, we learned how David inquired of God. At various instances, he inquired of God. How important it is for us to inquire of God. We also see Paul during his waiting time, he preached, he taught in synagogues. Even though he was persecuted, his life was threatened, he done, did not run away and hide. He was preaching, he was teaching. He also received revelations which he wrote down. Okay, So every season is actually a preparation process for the next season of life so we are in need to be in a constant state of learning of growing and maturing in the things of god even in the practical aspects okay the fifth one is that the unfolding of god given vision may differ from our expectation okay i'm sure that when david was anointed as king you know um uh he he would never have thought that you know he is going to be running away for to save his own life and he is going to be like a restless wanderer. 
protecting his own life and staying in the wilderness rather than being a, a king. Okay, so when um, you know during those times, you know um, what do we learn from David's life? When God imparts dreams and visions and you know gives us his heavenly uh, uh, goals and destinies, you know. Uh, don't let go even if the journey towards them is difficult and hard and it's, there's hardships and difficulties and it is not how you envisioned it, how not how you expected it. It's longer than you thought it would take. You need to stay the course and you will see the fu uh, vision fulfilled. Okay, so uh, that is about David's life. What about Joseph's life, you know? Uh, Joseph, he never thought he would be sold away by as a slave by his own brothers, and he would be falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, end up in prison. But all of that elevated him to be the prime minister of Egypt. Okay, what about Moses? He never imagined that him acting and taking justice in his own hand and being fair and being just. Um, by you know uh, protecting his brother would rest in him uh, being in the wilderness for the next 40 years and being a restless wanderer. So even as we go through various challenges and difficulties or when God gives us a vision, we can be very excited. But when we go through problems and difficulties, don't think that it's not God's vision or plan for your life. Stay the course, see his vision, to see his vision fulfilled. Okay. Because what God is about to unfold through our lives is not dependent on who we are, what we are, what skills we have, but it is God's glory that is going to be revealed in and through us, even as we are weak vessels, even as we might be frail, even as we have our own limitations, our own difficulties. Sometimes we might be so foolish, so weak, uh, uh, you know, despised by the world, nothing but God will fulfill his dream and vision and plan for our lives okay the sixth one is the kairos moment for a god-given vision gets delayed when attempted by self okay like what prince asked his question so we see 40 years it delayed in moses's life okay um so uh can there be delays in our life Yes, because we are all human, right? We all make um, mistakes. Um, but what do we do when when those we make those mistakes? There can be delays. There can be disappointments. There can be detours. There can it bring a lot about a lot of discouragement. But we need to hold on. What should we do? First, is, first thing when we make a mistake is what do we do? We repent. We ask God for forgiveness. And when we ask that, God is greater than our mistakes okay and there's nothing that is too complicated for him nothing that he can't resolve okay look at what the psalmist says when he found his feet in a net when he was trapped in his own temptation and his weakness what did he say he says my eyes are ever towards the lord so when you are caught up in a net in a mess you're you know tempted you know you've fallen in temptation you're you're ended up in a failure what do you do? Your eye should be upon the Lord. Okay. Sometimes our uh, uh, problems can end us up in a miry pit. Okay. Where we can't get ourselves out. We can't pull ourselves out. Okay. Because of repeated mistakes that we are making. Look at what the psalmist says. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He heard my cry and he pulled me out of the horrible pit. Okay. So God... Um, um, you know, when we make mistakes, when we go back to him, he's a God who restores. He's a restorer of our lives, our souls, our um, time. Um, you know, what he can do in um, uh, uh, in 10 years, he can do it in one year. You know, Jesus, just three years, he did the ministry. For Paul, he started in the age of 50, just, you know, did wonderful ministry later on. So, you know, um, God can accelerate things. Um, what takes many years to accomplish, God can fulfill in a much shorter time. All the years the locusts have eaten, God can restore. Okay. So what should we do when we make mistakes? We ask for forgiveness. 
Okay, we don't live in the past, we don't live in our mistakes, we move ahead, we learn from our mistakes, we become wiser, and we continue to pursue God's plan, vision for our lives, the plan that he has put into our lives. The seventh one is we have 11 to go, so that we are in the seventh one. The God-given vision may not be understood by everyone. Okay, now for more in the in the life of Moses, you know, we read in Acts chapter 7, verse 23, that God put in his heart when he was 40 years old to become, you know, to um, to lead the people of Israel. But we see that when Moses tried to help his own um, brother, Hebrew brother, they could not understand. His own people could not see God's hand. They could not see uh, the purpose why Moses was, uh, in, you know, in, in leadership, why he was in um, Pharaoh's palace, why he was raised up in Pharaoh's palace. His people did not understand. Okay. But we see that um, uh, also in, in Paul's life, when Paul became a believer, he um, encountered Jesus, there are many from the church who were still doubtful and suspicious of Paul. They did not want to do anything with Paul. Okay, And so we see that Paul spent a lot of time alone. Look at what he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Okay, So sometimes when God births a vision, a plan, and a dream, you know, we might have to just keep that within ourselves, pray about it, spend time understanding it. Okay, don't immediately confer with flesh and uh, blood. Okay, um, and God-given vision does not necessarily mean that it needs to have the approval of God. I mean, sorry, approval of people. It should have the approval of God, but sometimes people will not ap uh, approve of it. They might not understand it, but you know, um, you can still hold on to it. But God will send people who will help you, counsel you, guide you, show you the way, and uh, help you to execute your uh, uh, the plan and the vision that God has for your life. <laughs> Point eight. A God-given vision will face demonic um, opposition. Okay, so in the in the case of Nehemiah, it was not easy for Nehemiah, right? When he went to build the walls of Jerusalem, was it easy for him? No. If you read the book of Nehemiah, he faced a lot of problems and difficulties. The Arabs, you know, they tried to um, tried to do things where they could uh, accuse him, they could trap him. Even Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to ask him various tricky questions that they could trap him. Okay, um, But we see that irrespective of that, uh, you know, Nehemiah was able to fulfill God's plan and uh, purpose. Okay, So we know that when God gives us a plan and purpose, the devil is not happy with the authorization you get from heaven to do God's king to build God's kingdom okay he will do whatever it takes to oppose to hinder to divert us away from the work of the kingdom okay so how can satan divert our attention he can distract us okay he can get us to do things that are good but not seemingly good that is going to fulfill or birth God's plan and vision through our life. So we need to be very, very careful. Sometimes Satan can very subtly lead us to do good things, but those good things are not going to really help us to fulfill God's plan and vision. Okay, so that is a distraction. And what does distraction do? It breaks our vision, it breaks our focus. Uh, it results in wasted time and energy and resources. Okay. Okay, doing a good thing. Okay, doing a good thing but will not help us uh, fulfill God's purpose, um, a distraction. Now, for example, um, God has called you to um, uh, raise up, uh, you know, be a pastor for a church. Okay, you, he's called you to be a pastor. 
Okay. Um, so you can do that, but then also you're somebody who uh, loves business. You know, to, you you uh, you love business. You like to do engage in business. So maybe um, you can get distracted in. You were already running a business when God called you to be into full time ministry. A specific call to be a pastor to leave your business, but because of your love for that. You can seem to go back to doing it so that you can think that, hey, through this business, I can, um, you know, get a place for my church. I can raise a building. I can um, support myself. I can support my family. But there's nothing wrong in doing that. We, we learn we can do it if you're, if you're struggling financially. But if you're not and you're in a place, but because you love business, you want to go there, that can be a, a distraction. Uh, it can lead you away from what God has called you to. Uh, do so sometimes you can be doing good things but then you can be doing the, the, the wrong things at the wrong time in the wrong place okay um, or sometimes you can say uh, God wants you to start a church here in Bangor City but you get an opportunity to go to the US uh, to work with another uh, pastor or leader and you say maybe God is using and you're excited to go to the US you're, you're looking at it as an opportunity to go to the US but you're saying that hey, it's a good thing God is actually preparing me to be a, uh, uh, to be under the leadership of another pastor so I can learn but is God really taking you there for a preparation time or is God saying hey I want you to be here and start your work so you need to discern or um, you need to discern whether you uh, you know, uh, you start the, uh, uh, the sun, or you want you get an opportunity to go to the US to study something, you know, study another course, a Bible college course. But God is saying, I want you to uh, decide. So for me, my distraction was, uh, you know, when I was in full time ministry, um, you know, my sisters, they live in the US, they used to spend so much of money uh, buying all of those. Um, you know, uh, the forms and everything for schools to get me into counseling because I was interested in counseling. Okay, I was interested in counseling. God was did not have me as think of me as a counselor. Okay, so they had spent quite a lot of dollars in buying all of those uh, booklets and you know all of those handbooks from various colleges, and I wasted everything. And even now, when I meet some of my um, uh, my classmates in Bible college, they are shocked that I've never done a PhD and never even land. Sorry, I never did the MPH and never landed up doing a PhD. And they were wondering why I was just stuck up with only a BD. And I and it, they told me you have even the opportunities. Your sisters live in the US, and I told them God had never led me to do another course, not to do an MTH, not to do a PhD, but always to be in the ministry. And I never looked at those counseling courses. So that can also could have been like a distraction. I could have easily gotten and I could have gone to the US and lived there and continued into counseling. But that was not God, what God wanted for my life. Okay. So um, there's diversions, you know, um, um, demonic or opposition can bring diversions. And these can be like, you know, these diversions can be huge gaps or distance uh, that can uh, that Satan can bring in our uh, mission that he, he has for us. OK. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes even disputes, internal disputes that we have people. Uh, we are the vision bearer. People, God brings in uh, people. Sometimes we bring in the wrong people. We need to be very careful and they can cause a lot of strife and dispute and we can find ourselves fighting against them okay uh, disputes and strife and you know even with our own family even with our spouse children there can be disputes so you know all of these things can be very subtle ways that God brings and when you have people like that in your team who come in and they're trying you know they're trying to bring in disputes and strifes don't fight them you know, I've learned from managing teams with um, Children's Church and Catalyst. I've learned not to fight with people. You know, uh, I know what they're doing behind my back, but I know and I say, God, I don't have the time and the energy to fight them. And fighting them is going to be a wastage of my time and energy and is going to bring about disunity. I just want to maintain unity. And I've just prayed about it and I've seen how God just removes them so beautifully. God will fight your 
battles. You let him fight. It is his kingdom. It's not my kingdom. It's not my ministry. I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to do things right in the way God wants me to do things that is right. That is to keep unity in the team. I keep unity. I I I um uh, I'm nice to them, but I'm I still know what they're doing and how they're trying to bring in disunity. And I've just seen how beautifully God just takes them away. He just fights your battle. Okay. And the other thing is discouragement. You know, Satan can bring that very easily. You know, when we get discouraged, we just want to drop everything, run, move away. We just want to leave. You know, sometimes uh, uh, it is very, very difficult. Discouragement is something difficult. It's very difficult to encourage yourself because you keep oscillating between encouragement, discouragement, encouragement, discouragement. And sometimes you're so fed up, you just want to leave everything and um, run. Okay. I remember at one point of time in my ministry, I wanted to just leave, not ministry and run, but I wanted to leave that place where I was ministering. And... Um, God was taking me to the life of Paul as a missionary and the difficulties and the challenges he faced. And at the end of that one week, I said, okay, God, you know, um, I'm going to go back in this same ministry and I'm going to minister there, even though things are challenging and difficult for me. And then after a one day, I saw things, you know, again, back to discouragement. And I said, God, I'm not going back. And that's when God gave me one line, which was like a punch line, punched me on my face. It says, ministry is not a matter of convenience. It's a command. It's not your convenience. I want to go back. I don't want to go back. It's not your convenience. It's a command. God saying, go back. And I know that at the right time, God took me away from that place and let me somewhere else. So, you know, um, uh, even when we are discouraged, we need to learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. That is what David did. Remember when he came back and he saw all of his the wife, children, all of uh, his uh, 400 men's wives and children, all his property, everything that belonged to him taken away. Uh, his men and he were crying and mourning and his men were thinking of killing David. And what did David do? He strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. You know, what did he, what he would have done is by strengthening himself, he would have just worshipped God, he would have loved God, he would have shown God love. Somehow he strengthened himself. So it's very important for us in our ministry to you know, be connected to uh, uh, to God, be strengthened. Okay. Then um, the ninth thing is a God-given vision is always bigger than the individual. Okay. Um, so we see that even in Nehemiah's life, the building of the wall was a very big vision. Okay. But we see that Nehemiah says that he, when he went to uh, Jerusalem, he never shared with anyone what was in his heart. He kept it as a secret. He surveyed the entire place. But when the right time came, he told his people. Okay. Look at what he says in Nehemiah chapter 2 verses uh, um, uh, uh, 18. He says, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. So he says, come, let us rise up and build the walls of Jerusalem. Okay. So the right time, he tells the people and they all come in and they uh, pitch in and they work. Even if you look at the life of Paul, we see that Paul was not an I, me, myself man. You know, I'm the apostle, I'm great, I know everything, uh, you know, I don't need anyone. But we see that he had many people who were working along with him and he called them in various names. He called them as fellow workers, you know, partners, fellow helpers, fellow laborers, fellow servants, fellow prisoners. And he always, at the end of his letters, he always mentions people who are with him in the ministry. Okay. So, so you know, sometimes, um, you know, we all want big vision to give us a big dream, big goal, big plan and purpose, which is very good. But we need to have big hearts. Why big hearts? Because the big vision requires a big heart, which means it requires other people to come alongside to help you. Sometimes we don't want other people to come alongside because we think they will rob us of our the fame, the name and the, uh, the, the applause that we need to um, get. Okay. So we need to connect with people, bring the right people into our vision. Okay. And even as they come into our vision, you know, we need to celebrate them. We need to encourage them. Uh, we need to uh, build them up also as um, well. And we need to, you know, share the vision with the right kind of people. 
uh, in the right manner so that they can step in. And even as some of them come in, we need to celebrate some. Some who don't want to step into our vision, we shouldn't be angry with them. Okay, We should not get upset with them. We should not do away with their lives. It's because God did not you know, have plan and purpose for them to be in our vision. Okay, Whenever somebody steps into the two projects I handle and they want to leave, I always thank them and bless them and send them. Because it's not my project. It's not what I'm doing. It's God's kingdom. It is his church, his work that I'm doing. And if he's taking them away, God will bring somebody else. And God has purposed something else for them. So release them and send them. No use of um, fighting. Okay, But we need to be cautious and wise who we need to share and who we need to invite. If you don't be cautious, if you're not smart, that can create the most problem for you. Okay, People, uh, kingdom building is all about building people. But also people can be the greatest hindrance and barrier and can also destroy your peace of mind so much so that your health issues are, you know, so come to a place where you can't even do ministry anymore. Okay. Two more points. Tenth one is other people find and fulfill their life's calling by participating in your God-given vision. God will bring other people into your vision. You need to be wise to choose the right people. But even as they come in, don't use them. Okay. Make use of their skills and their ability. Don't use them for your own benefits, for your own privileges, for your own fame and name. Okay. Acknowledge them. Keep their interests in mind also. Okay. And uh, they're co-laboring with you. Give them the rightful place and the due honor that they also require. Okay. The eleventh one is um, even as God gives us dreams and visions, it's all interlinked with each other. Okay, it's interlinked with others' dreams and vision in the body of Christ. So we are all having our dreams and visions that God has given, but it is all for the purpose of building and enhancing His kingdom, the church. Okay, so we need to partner with each other and build God's kingdom. I'm not saying that I do it in isolation, that is wrong, but build together, partner with others, and we will fulfill what God has called us to do. Okay. Any questions on this lesson? Chapter 4. Online students, any questions you all have? Rin is looking at how much more we have to cover. <laughs> well, don't look at it. It's a nightmare for me myself. I'm just praying that I'll be able to finish it in uh, time. Sorry? Yeah. Yes. I'm just sticking to what is there in the notes. I'm not doing anything extra. <laughs> yeah. Pastor, I have one question. Pastor, can you hear me? Yes, Jacqueline, very clearly. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, Pastor, when, uh, when God brings in people and we know that God's calling is there in their lives and we try to encourage them and bring them up, but we see that sometimes they are not, they get discouraged and they actually don't see where God sees them. So at that point in time, how much can we uh, as people or like encourage them or we know for sure that, you know, God has a calling for them. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know like how to say because they, they are willing, but they get discouraged so easily. So at that point in time, do we just pray for them and leave them alone or should we uh, keep a, uh, I mean, like continual touch with them or like how do we deal with such people? Yeah, good question. Thank you, Jackin. So there's an extent till where we can journey with people. You know, uh, we can't um, we can't come to a place where we can think for them, make them do what we want. I think even God does that with our own lives, right? He's given us the free will to choose, the moral free will to choose. You know, so he tells us what is right and wrong, but then he says, "Hey, if you want to choose this, you choose. You go your own way. I will let you go your own way." Okay, so that is even God dealing with us, you know, the way he deals with us. He tells us what is right and wrong. He's given us various 
parameters. He's given us his word, the Holy Spirit. He's given us our conscience, nature. Romans chapter 1 says, nature even talks about the divine attributes, the Godhead. So we are without any excuse. But he says in Romans chapter 1, irrespective of that, people have chosen lies instead of the truth. They have given exchange the glory of God to the glory of man-made things. And so what does God say? I give them up. You know, I've, I've given them up. I let them go their own way. So what we can do with for people is to an extent we can journey with them, helping them. But if we see them, you know, coming back to the same place where self-pity, you know, and all of those things, there's nothing more we can really do rather than just pray for them and, you know, um, uh, ask God to work and the Holy Spirit to work in their uh, lives. Because ultimately, it's not our words, it's not we are gifts, our skill, and our charisma, the Holy Spirit working in them. So if the Holy, they're not listening to the Holy Spirit, then, you know, they can't even listen to us. So we just pray and leave them. And I think, you know, God will orchestrate situations in life where they will learn uh, through those situations and, you know, ultimately listen to the what the Holy Spirit is saying. Yes. Did that help? Okay, thank you, Jackin. That was a good question. Uh, we told about uh, God gives people in our life. Like we need our people. Like God places some people in our life to fulfill the purpose. Or uh, so, like if uh, if that relationship was broken, like if uh, God attached it to people, like like to be a successor. For someone or help them in their uh, vision and uh, if uh, because of their heart attitudes or because of their behavior uh, their relationship got broken uh, and they got separated so uh, so is it like god find some other person or god restores would god find someone else yes he would find somebody else to bring that person in uh, God always would want to restore that person. The Holy Spirit will continue to work, though they're not yielding and hard-hearted and stubborn, and they're not willing to listen to the Holy Holy Spirit. Then God would let them be, but He still want, would want to restore their lives. Yes, He is a restorer. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. There are no more questions. We'll move on to chapter five. Okay. We look at kingdom builders lifestyle okay um uh, as kingdom builders sometimes we are so caught up in building god's kingdom that we forget that god is more interested in our character in our lives and who we are than what we are doing okay so who we are and the life we live uh, as kingdom builders is more important to God than what we are doing, okay? So we're going to look at three main areas, godly character, spiritual maturity, and stewardship, okay? Um, what is um, character? Character is basically your attitudes, your nature, your behavior, your temperaments, your personality, okay, your uh, who you are as a person, okay, um, and it is not who you really are before people, but who are you in the secret, quiet, uh, okay, uh, in your own quiet space, okay, and your character is revealed through your actions, your behavior to your conduct, okay, um, and your actions and your reactions actually reveal your character your actions and your reactions in difficult and unexpected circumstances actually reveal who you are as a person it reveals your nature your character your temperament your um, uh, you know your disposition your personality it reveals who you are especially when you how you react um, uh, uh, to in difficult and unexpected uh, circumstances okay your secret choices also reveal your character your words attitudes and decisions also reveal your character your value systems what influences you also reveals your character so let's look at um, an example of joseph 
Okay. Now we know that Joseph served faithfully for 11 years in Potiphar's uh, house. But we see that, you know, he had a very difficult time there. And uh, he was tempted by Pharaoh's, uh, sorry, Potiphar's wife. Okay. But we see in spite of the repeated temptations, uh, what was Joseph's stand? He had the power to say no. And why do you think he had the power to say no? Fear of God and because he had a strong moral character. His character was, no, this is not right. Okay. We see that in verse 8. Okay, He refused uh, and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, but he has committed all that he has to my hands. Okay. Your conscience will also keep you accountable to God when no one is watching. I love verse 9. You know, um, when when Joseph says, how can I sin against God? I When I read this the first time in my life, I just, it just, it stuck with me. I'm saying, but this young man, you know, um, in when repeatedly facing this temptation, in the face of temptation, thought about how can I sin against God? And I was looking at my own life, times when I have sinned, have I ever thought, man, and I, if I do this sin, it is going to grieve the heart of God. It is going to break the heart of God. I think if we, if we think that, we will never do, if we really love God, we will never do that, whatever it is. Okay. So he had um, um, his conscience, you know, uh, uh, towards God, conscience towards his master, kept him accountable even when nobody was watching. Okay. And he was he had the ability to say no because he had a strong character, you know. Without having a strong character, you can say not say no to anyone and everyone's difficult. You need to have a strong character, okay? Uh, and a strong character cannot be weakened and will not give in to continual temptation. Okay, so we see here that he was continually tempted, but he he did not give in to his. Uh, temptation. Okay, so how is character developed? We look at um, another example in the Bible, that of Daniel. Okay, now we see that Daniel, when he was very young, okay, he in his early teens he was taken to Babylon as a captive, but he was taken to the palace. Okay, and in this palace there were ten ten. Uh, Israelite boys who were from royal families were chosen, who were to be taught everything about the Babylonian language, science, math, everything. And at the end of three years, you know, they were supposed to be given food from the king's table, everything. End of three years, Pharaoh is going to give them a test, and then he's going to choose officials from his from these ten uh, Israelite boys, all young teenage boys. And when they were served food from the king's table. You know, this is another example that has stuck in my life. You say, no, uh, what did Daniel and his three friends do? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decided they will not eat the, the food from the king's table. You know, I was thinking, what would I would have done? You know, I would have said, hey, you know, this is a king's order. I can't disobey the king's order. I will die. You know, you're living in the palace. You have to eat the king's food, um, you know, and it's good food and all of those things. Okay. Uh, but here, they said, we don't want the, this food. Why? Because it was not according to the standards of uh, the Israelites, what God had asked them to eat. And I was thinking, even in the area of food, where some of us would think, you know, should we honor God with food? You know, we should honor God in other things, what we watch, we shouldn't watch, say, thoughts, all of those things in an area like food. So we see that even in a simple thing like food, Daniel and his three friends wanted to honor God when they were just teens. You know, teens, in their teenage years, they just want to eat and eat and eat and eat and indulge in a lot of food, you know. But here are these three young men. So, you know, what do we learn? That character is developed at a very early age when you stand by your convictions and we see that God honored Daniel and his friends and they were they were able to answer all the questions that the king asked and king thought they were too super 
brilliant. They were not just super brilliant, but God gave them the wisdom. God honored them for honoring him. And I think God even looks at us when the way we honor him in a simple thing like food. You know, and I'm thinking God will also honor us in the way we dress the way we conduct ourselves, you know, simple things in every area of our lives, God wants us to honor him. Okay. And it's never too early to start, you know, uh, developing a godly character. Okay. We also see that uh, our character is influenced by our friends. So we see Daniel, you know, Daniel and his three friends, they decided they will not eat from the king's, the food. But the other six guys, they said, hey, Let's enjoy, let's feast, you know, come on, belt it, you know, uh, enjoy. But these, Daniel and his three friends, they, they resolve in their heart, they will not define themselves by eating that king's food. So a character also is influenced by our companions, the friends that we um, have, okay? And a, a character is built over time through discipline and practice. And we see this in the life of? Um, Daniel, you know, when the uh, when the king gave the order for the next 40 days, nobody should um, uh, pray um, to any other god. What does Daniel do? As was his custom in his early days. It says, you know, uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. You know, uh, now when Daniel knew the writing, he went home in his upper room, opened the windows toward Jerusalem, bent down his knees three times a day and pray and gave thanks, as was his custom since his early days. So, you know, to get children to practice things from a very early days is something that they will not forget, becomes a practice. Okay. So he, in spite of that uh, order, he went and did what was his ritual, what was his custom. Okay. And strong moral character is strengthened through adversity, even through challenges, even through difficulties. Look at what uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 says. Can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Amen. Okay. So we should, what does it say? We should glory in tribulation. That means we should, you know, praise God. We should be worshiping. We should be happy when we are going through what? Tribulations. You know, something very difficult for us to do. Why? Because tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Okay. Now, uh, why is character very, very important okay we see that godly character is a prerequisite for kingdom ministry okay if you look at first timothy chapter 3 verses 5 1 to 15 paul is uh, actually writing to young timothy who he leaves um, um there in the church and he's saying you know at ephesus and he's saying you know i want you to choose good leaders and he's saying choose bishops and so what is he saying the choose bishops who are godly who pray Five times a day who fast. Huh? He's saying that who read their Bible, the Torah, you know, they're always in the church. Is he saying that? No, what is he saying? He's talking about that there should be husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. You know, able to rule their own house, take care of their own children, you know, not puffed up with pride. So he's just not, he must be reverent, not double tongue, not given too much wine, not greedy for money. Look at all that. It's all talking about basic moral character, you know, your attitudes, your behavior. He's not saying, hey, there should be someone fasting five times a day. Uh, they should be knowing the Torah. They should be, you know, doing this. They should be doing that. Not spiritual rituals so to say, but talking about lifestyle, okay? So, you know, uh, and he says, likewise, deacons. You know what deacons? What are deacons? Huh? Helpers. Helpers, like administrators in the church. And look at the look at the list what he says for them in verses 11 to verse 15. I just want all of you to quietly read that for yourself. Verses 11 to 15. In um, First Timothy chapter three, verses one, chapter one, verses eleven to fifteen.
And look at what the, uh, Paul is writing to Titus, um, you know, who he left at Crete the, to oversee the churches at Crete. He's saying, you know, I want you to choose the right people for leadership in the church. And look at what he's telling them. Just uh, read um, verses 6 to verse 9 for yourselves again, please. So important. Sorry, yes. Titus 1, 5 to 9. So read First Timothy, Titus 1, 5 to 9, and also First Timothy chapter 1, verses 11 to 15. So he's not talking here about how anointed, how gifted, how much they can speak in tongues. You know, they're flowing in all the gifts of the Spirit, which is the ministry office they're called to. But he's talking about their lifestyle, right? He's talking about their character. So in kingdom building, God is looking more for not just our anointing, because he can pour the anointing, he can pour. But if he pours in a vessel that is not having a good character, the anointing will be wasted. It will ruin and break the hearts of many. That is what is happening around the world. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9 verse 17. Can somebody read that please? Matthew chapter 9 verse 17. Matthew chapter 9 verse 17. Nor do they put new wine into old skins or else the wine skins break and the wine is spilled and the wine skin are ruined but they put new wine into new wineskin and both are preserved we learn this uh, amen we learn this in uh, ministers foundation right the anointing is the wine a character is the wineskin if the if the character is weak the wineskin is weak what will happen the wine will break and burst and the wine will be wasted the same way if our character is weak the anointing will be wasted okay and uh, we also learned in the minister's foundation in that publication you know um, uh, your gift can take you where your character cannot keep you if you don't have the good character you might be the most gifted anointed person but it can you know you can't stay too long it will not hold you there so we need strength of character to help us you know to uh, to the great heights that god takes us or brings us into okay we'll stop here we just have one more minute any questions any questions mm -hmm. okay so you can uh, you can be the most um, you can have uh, uh, like you can be a very gifted person in, in some area. Okay? You can have all the skills, the gifts that is required for that ministry, whether it's worship or, you know, youth ministry or children's ministry. But if you don't have a, your character, your character in the sense you are, you know, you're a gossiper, loud-mouthed, you, you, you know, you lose your patience, you can't handle people, you're very bossy, you're very dominating, uh, you're very rude, uh, you know, um, uh, you are not, um, you're somebody who's I, me, myself, everything has to be about me, you know, and all of those things, then what is the point of your gifting? It, you can't last long in that ministry, in that place. Nobody would want you. People will be rebelling against you. There'll be strife. There'll be disunity. There'll be, a, you know, a break, a, 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 a disorder. And so you have, you're a very gifted person, but your character is not able to hold that gifting. Then there is no place. Nobody would want to work with a boss like that, right? Nobody would want to work with a team leader, ministry leader, a pastor with with this kind of an attitude, who's talking down, bossing, you know, dominating, not patient, uh, you know, bringing about division, gossiping behind people, uh, not living a, a honorable and a holy lifestyle. You can see through people, right? And it's not going to hold your gifting. Nobody would want to even come and pray for, uh, ask you to pray or, be, you know, 
you know, even you, you won't even want to go to a church and listen to such a pastor, or you won't even want to serve under such a ministry leader or a team leader. So you can be the best gifted person, but if you don't have your character, your gifts cannot hold you, um, you know, in that place of uh, position and authority. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for joining class. We'll continue um, next week. Okay. Um, some important things we learned today, hope you can implement that and practice even as we are in the process of kingdom building. Okay, thank you. Have a blessed day and a blessed week, everybody. God bless.